<coughs> thank you, Avi, and thanks, Noga, for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be back in Princeton. Thanks for braving uh, the tornado watch to come here. I appreciate it. So uh, the, the title of today's talk is Stanley Wolf Limits Are Typically Exponential. Uh, so we'll start with some definitions. Uh, permutation pi of the numbers 1 through n is called an n permutation. Uh, and we need the concept of permutation containment. So a permutation sigma contains another permutation pi if there's a, a subsequence of sigma that has the same order as pi. And otherwise, you say that sigma avoids pi. So let's see an example so we understand this definition. Um, let's look at the permutation on seven letters, uh, 7265314, uh, which means that 1 maps to 7, 2 maps to 2, 3 maps to 6, 4 maps to 5, 5 maps to 3, 6 maps to 1, and, one, and 7 maps to 4. Uh, this permutation on seven letters contains the permutation 4, 3, 1, 2 because of the, uh, the bold letters. So 7, 5, 1, 4 uh, has the order type 4, 3, 1, 2. Uh, that's because of the four numbers, 7 is the largest, 5 is uh, the second largest, so that's the third in the or in amongst the four. Uh, 1 is the smallest, so it's 1, and 4 is the second smallest, so it's 2. Is that clear? Okay. It also contains the integral of the smaller pi. Right. Yeah, so I, I picked a random example and, and, and then picked a random subsequence and then looked at the, uh, the order of that. Um, so yeah, I, I wasn't careful, but then you can check that uh, it has no increasing subsequence of length 4, and so it avoids 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, and it's natural in the area of enumerative combinatorics to study Sn pi, which is the number of n permutations avoiding pi. So the number of n permutations in total is n factorial, and now we want to count the number that avoids a given permutation pi. Uh, and there's classical results in this area of McMahon from almost 100 years ago and, and Knuth, which imply that for a three permutation, so for any permutation on three letters, uh, Sn pi is the nth Catalan number. And uh, so in particular, this is very roughly about 4 to the n. So it's roughly like an, expo it's an exponential function. And uh, note here that uh, it doesn't matter what the pi is, only just the size of pi in this example. So it's, uh, it only depends on the fact that it's a permutation on three letters. Uh, in general, it will depend on the permutation pi. Um, okay. And there's a, a classical conjecture in this area, an old conjecture, um, well known, called the Stanley Wolf conjecture. It says that for each permutation pi, there's a number L of pi such that Sn pi to the 1 over n tends to L of pi. So that uh, Sn of pi grows exponential in some constant, which is the Stanley Wolf limit called L of pi. Um, this conjecture is equivalent to a seemingly weaker conjecture. This was noted by Aratia. The, the seemingly weaker conjecture is just that Sn pi grows at most an exponential function in, in, in n. Um, and the reason why they're equivalent is Sn of pi is super multiplicative in n. So Sn plus m pi is at least Sn pi times Sn pi. And the reason for this is if you have two permutations which avoid pi, there's a way to concatenate them so that you still uh, avoid pi. Okay. This is a, a famous conjecture in this area. And in, in 1981, Regev proved that the 
Stanley Wilk limit of the identity permutation is k minus 1 squared. He actually gave an asymptotic formula for Sn pi, and in, in the case of pi is the identity on k letters. And uh, the reason for this is that um, those that avoid the increasing sequence, an increasing sequence of length k, uh, are precisely those permutations that can be partitioned into k minus 1 decreasing subsequences. Uh, originally, Wolf and Stanley made stronger conjectures, which uh, are false. Uh, Wolf thought that L of pi should be at most k plus 1, if pi is a k permutation. And Stanley thought that it should always be k minus 1 squared. So you immediately see that these contradict each other. Um, they didn't know about that e each other were, were originally conjecturing this. And uh, examples show that, that neither of these conjectures were right, and they quickly uh, came to this uh, Stanley Wolf conjecture above. Um, now, there was uh, substantial progress made in the direction of the Stanley Wolf conjecture uh, that Sn pi is at most uh, something that's roughly exponential <coughs> times some extremely slow growing function in the exponent. Um, uh, so, gamma of n is a very slow growing function related to the Ackermann hierarchy. So it's very close to an exponential function, but slightly more. And uh, there were many results in this area. Eventually, uh, there was this breakthrough work of Marcus and Tardosh, which gave a, a very elegant argument and proved the uh, Stanley Wolf conjecture. Um, they proved that this L of pi for a k permutation pi is at most some double exponential in k. Uh, so there's still a huge gap here between the roughly uh, quadratic bound and uh, this double exponential bound. And the next natural question is, how large can L of pi be for a k permutation oh. pi? Yes? Yes. Oh, okay. Standard super multiplicity with upper power. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, so it's a good question. We, um, and we, we discussed this. Uh, so how large can L of pi be for a k permutation pi? So we know uh, it's not hard to show that L of pi is at least quadratic in k. And we have this upper bound, which is this double exponential function. Uh, there was a conjecture of Aratia in 1999, and he, he put a bounty of $100 on this, that L of pi is always at most k minus 1 squared. Uh, this was open for a while. Uh, it was eventually disproved by um, the example 4231, so this permutation on four letters. It's bigger than 9.47, and uh, if you plug in k equals 4, the conjecture was that it's at most 9. So it's... Uh, about 5% too large. So they split the $100 pie away? I'm not, I'm not sure how this worked out. Yeah, that's a good question <laughs> for, for financial. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's a good point. Um, so uh, this conjecture is false, but uh, everybody in this area seemed to believe that it should be quadratic in K. And L of pi should always be quadratic in K. Um, and uh, one of the, the reasons people believed this conjecture was because of another conjecture, uh, that L of pi is maximized over all K permutations pi somewhere on some small set of permutations called layered partitions, permutations. And these are a, a very special class of permutations. A permutation is layered if it is a concatenation of decreasing sequences the letters of each sequence being smaller than the letters in the following sequences. So you have these decreasing sequences, and they go up uh, one after the other. Can you multiply them after uh, No. So you have these decreasing sequences, and then they're uh, smaller than the ones oh, in the following the ones. ones. Yes. Um, and so the conjecture of Bona 
was that over all k permutations pi, the Stanley Wilf limit is maximized on some layered permutation. So you don't need to, the conjecture was that you don't need to look at all the permutations, you can just look at a layered permutation. Well, the identity is a special case. The identity is a special case of this. So that's decreasing sequences that are increasing, each one of, of length one. Um, that's a good. The reverse is also a special case, yes. Um, it is. It is. Four, two, and then three, and then. Uh, right, but maybe the reverse is. So one. Yeah, so one, and then three, two, and then four. So you can partition it into three subs decreasing subsequences. Yeah. So, so this conjecture is not disproved by this previous example. Um, in fact, uh, there in, in a number of combinatorics, uh, they often make these huge tables with computers to compute exact values. And then from these huge tables, you can uh, check conjectures or make new conjectures based on patterns that you see in, this, uh, in these huge tables. And uh, this conjecture was backed by a lot of numerical evidence coming from these uh, tables. Um, and with more evidence for the original conjecture, it was proved last year that every layered k permutation satisfies that the Stanley Wilf limit is at most quadratic in k. So, uh, so if this conjecture of Bona is true, then the original conjecture is also true. Um, and the first main result I want to tell you about is that all of these conjectures are false. Uh, and in fact, um, there's a k permutation pi with the Stanley Wilf limit is exponential in, in k to the one fourth. Um, in fact, almost all k permutations will satisfy a slightly weaker estimate, where you lose a, a log factor in the exponent. Okay, so we'll prove this. Um, and this is in terms of the lower bound. What about the, the upper bound? Um, so before we get to that, uh, over the years there was uh, a very interesting connection between uh, the Stanley Wilf limits and uh, an extremal problem for matrices, which was rather unexpected. Uh, so all matrices we are going to consider are binary. That means that all the entries are 0 or 1. And the mass of a matrix is the number of 1 entries. It's also the sum of the entries of the matrix. Uh, we're going to need to know, understand the, the notion of containment of one matrix inside another matrix. So matrix A contains another matrix P if there's a submatrix of A such that if uh, Pij is 1, then the corresponding entry in, in this D, which is a submatrix of A, is also 1. And otherwise, you say that A avoids P. Uh, if you don't like to work with matrices and you rather work with bipartite graphs, uh, you can think of the rows of the matrices as vertices of one part and the columns as vertices as of another part. And this containment relation is uh, an ordered subgraph relation. So P corresponds to some bipartite graph. And uh, this containment is whether or not P is an ordered subgraph of A. So the vertices have to preserve the same order. So that the vertices are of both parts are ordered and you need to see P is in the same order as you see A. The all ones matrix contains everything. Yeah. That's a smaller size. Is this equivalent to the statement that the Hadamard problem that P and P should be uh, should be equal to P? Yeah, they are not of the same size. P is much smaller. Mm -hmm. Just on some some sub matrix. It's true that the Hadamard plot has both P and some sub matrix such that it is equal to P. Yeah. Yes. This is, this is a bit uh, confusing that you write B as BIJ because it's uh, the, the, the number of these uh, rows and columns are not. You just care about the order. Right. Yes. Yes. You care. You care about the order. So you, you the IJ uh, is it's a sub matrix. So I you. Is you some, but I and J. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, so, they're great, they're all so they're really subsequences in A, yeah. Okay. So uh, a, a very natural and old problem in uh, extreme combinatorics is to study the maximum mass, the maximum number of one entries you can have in an n by n matrix which avoids p. So this is xnp. And for a permutation pi, you uh, define xn pi to be xnp, where p is the permutation matrix of pi. So permutation matrices will have a, a one in every row and column. Uh, now, a little over 20 years ago, Ferretti and Heinel conjectured that for every permutation pi, xn pi is at most linear in n. The constant here will depend on, on pi. Um, and now we're going to see a connection between this problem and the, the Stanley Wolf conjecture. Um, before we do that, uh, this is equivalent to the limit as n tends to infinity of xn pi over n existing, uh, this is because xn pi is super additive. And if you have one matrix that avoids pi, uh, rather avoids the permutation matrix of pi, and you have another matrix which avoids the permutation matrix of pi, you can take their direct sum uh, in such a way that you can also avoid pi. Um, and so that gives super additivity, and imply this is equivalent to the, this limit existing. And this is the Ferretti Heinel limit. In other words, if you have a super number of ones, you should contain every. You should contain every, yeah. Every permutation matrix. Uh, right. Okay. So uh, let's see the connection between the two of these conjectures. Um, Clauser proved that the Stanley Wilf limit is at most exponential in the Ferretti Heinel limit, and we'll show the proof of this a little bit later. Uh, and Marcus and Tardosh then proved that, uh, so that's a, Clauser proved this assuming that these numbers existed, or equivalently, it's essentially saying that the Stanley Wilf conjecture follows from the Ferretti Heinel conjecture. And then Marcus, Tardosh, uh, Marcus and Tardosh proved that the uh, uh, that the Ferretti Heinel conjecture is true with C of pi at most this exponential in K log K. Um, now, uh, this is a, a rather weak estimate for L of pi in terms of the Ferretti Heinel limit. It turns out, it was shown more recently that by Kabulka, that the Stanley Wilf limit and the Ferretti Heinel limit are. Uh, polynomially related. So they're uh, bounded by polynomials in each other, and so they're, they're rather closely related. Um, uh, I'll show you the, so the proof of this in the original paper is rather long and with a lot of computational work. Uh, it's more than three pages. I'll show you a very short proof, new proof of this as well. <coughs> exactly. So as, as Avi pointed out, this implies that L of pi is at most exponential in K log K. And you can go through the Marcus Tardish proof and try to uh, improve it. And if, you're, uh, if, if you work do it correctly, you can get at least, an ex you can improve it a bit so that L of pi is at most exponential in K, and C, so is C of pi. Um, No, no, it's through C of pi. Yeah, yeah. So you get a uh, bound on C of pi, yeah. Um, so these, these problems are, are tied together, and we'll see all the reason why they're tied together a little bit later. Um, it's helpful to introduce a, a new notion called interval minors of matrices. And... Uh, uh, this notion is, notion is implicit in previous works, but it's, it's quite helpful to pull it out and give it a name. Um, so interval minors, we define the notion of contraction. So we have a matrix. Uh, the contraction of two consecutive rows of the matrix replaces the two rows by a single row with a one, entry, one in an entry of the new row if at least one of the two entries in the original two rows is a one. So this is like taking the union. Um, 
And contraction of columns is defined similarly. So you're only allowed to contract consecutive rows or consecutive columns. And I want to show you an example of this so you see. Uh, up here we have a, a four by four matrix. And if we contract the first two rows, because the first uh, column that you see a one zero, because there's at least one one, you get a one. The next one you see a zero and a one, you get another one. But a zero, zero will become a zero. And a one, one will become a one. So you get uh, a three by four matrix uh, when you contract. Uh, and, and then there's a, a notion of interval minor. So uh, matrix P is an interval minor of A. If P is contained in a matrix obtained, obtained from A by contraction of consecutive rows or columns. So first you contract some of your rows and columns, and then you, you see if P is, uh, is contained in one of these contractions. Yes. Yes. So let's see an example of this. So this is a, a local definition of contraction, but you can an, an interval minor, but you can make a global definition where you take disjoint intervals of rows, I1, I2, say uh, up to I3 in this example, and disjoint intervals of columns, and then uh, you replace uh, you replace each block by a zero or one, depending on whether it's, if it's all zeros, then it becomes a zero. Otherwise, it's a one. Um, and uh, so in this example, we have three in disjoint intervals of rows and three disjoint intervals of columns. And when you contract them, you'll get this three by three matrix. Is that clear? Okay, so this is, uh, turns out to be a very interesting um, notion to study and is closely related to permutation containment. Uh, one of the, the very important but very simple facts in, about interval minors is that containing a permutation, or rather a permutation matrix, is equivalent to containing it as an interval minor. So even though in general containing an interval minor is a much weaker notion, for permutations, it's equivalent to the usual containment. So uh, here's a, a little lemma we'll have next. So first we need to know what the all ones matrix is. And we denote this by JL. So here's an example, J3. It's it's a three by three matrix, in general the L by L, and it's just all ones. Um, now you can see immediately that JL will contain all the L permutations. Here I'm using interchangeably a matrix, a permutation matrix and its permutation. Uh, and a very simple lemma about, well, it's very easy to see that JL contains all the L permutations. Uh, and a partial converse is true. So the partial converse is that there's going to be an L squared permutation whose matrix contains JL as an interval minor. Um, why is that? We want to make a permutation matrix, which is L squared by L squared, which contracts to the L by L all ones matrix. So a random one will, a random one will work with an extra. You need a log yeah, factor log additionally. Log. Yeah, so a random one will work, as Avi pointed out, with an extra log factor. And what you need for, to construct one um, is that you need, you, you can partition the L squared into blocks, so intervals of columns, which are size L, L of them, and intervals of rows, which are size L, there's L of them. And you need in each of these blocks at least one one. And this is e rather easy to do. One takes a, a couple minutes, and you, one can come up with a, a simple example doing this. Or as Avi pointed out, with an extra log L loss, you can just take a random matrix, uh, permutation matrix. Okay. So uh, now we come to the lower bound construction. Uh, and we're first going to look at 
a complete binary tree. We're going to take two identical copies of those, that complete binary tree. We're going to make another matrix B, which will also be helpful. And then finally, from that new matrix B that we make, we're going to make uh, a matrix M, which is what we really want. Okay? So uh, what's the, the key lemma? We'll call it a theorem here. So um, uh, let n be exponential in square root of L. And there's going to be an n by n matrix M with mass at least n to the 3 halves, which avoids JL as an interval minor. This is going to be the key lemma. And from this, it'll be very easy to deduce the lower bounds that we're looking for. Um, with a little bit of a loss on the n value, you can get a n by n matrix, which is almost complete. So instead of having mass n to the 3 halves, you can have up to n squared in general in an n by n matrix, the number of 1s. You can have density 1 minus 1 over some power of L, and then you'll lose a little bit on the, on the, the size of the matrix. It'll still be exponential in the power of L, but it'll be something like uh, a sixth instead of a half here. And, and this proof will, can be modified to do this. So, uh, so how do we do this construction of M? Right. I don't care about the connection between K that's the length of the permutation and the permutation matrix and the, yeah, the matrix you want to not to assume the theorem, it should depend only on K. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. So we're going to show, as Avi said, how to get from this to the, uh, to the desired results after we, we prove this, this lemma. It's pretty quick from this to get to where we're, we're supposed to go. Um, and, but we need to understand the construction of this exponentially s large matrix, which avoids this interval minor. So, uh, so first we consider a complete binary tree T of height R. The, the root of the tree is going to be the interval of integers from 1 to 2 to the R. Uh, the root has two children, and uh, the two children of a parent will always partition the interval into two new intervals of equal size. So one of the children of the parent will be uh, 2 to the R minus 1 of the root, will be the interval of numbers from 1 to 2 to the R minus 1, and the other child will be the interval of positive numbers, positive integers from 2 to the R minus 1 plus 1 to 2 to the R. So you have this complete binary tree. And this is all just going to be helpful for defining M. And this complete binary tree, it has height R. The, the root has height 0. goes all the way down to height R. The leaves, because each child is a partition into two equal intervals of the parent, uh, the leaves will be the numbers 1 to 2 to the R. Well, it'll be the, the singletons from 1 to 2 to the R. OK, so this is this complete binary tree T. And uh, we're going to use this to make uh, a matrix B, which we're going to then use to make M. So T uh, will take two identical copies of T, uh, TR, R here for rows, and TC, C for columns. We're going to take two identical copies. And then we're going to make a matrix B as follows. Um, so we're going to pick some parameters Q and then prime first. Uh, Q is 1 over 8R. And N prime is the number of vertices in this tree. And we have two copies of this tree. Uh, now we're going to make a, this matrix B. Um, it's going to be, the rows will be indexed by vertices uh, of these two trees. So uh, each row will correspond to an interval, which is a vertex of TR. And each column of B will correspond to a, uh, a vertex, which is an interval, uh, a vertex of TC, which is an interval. So an interval I in this tree and an interval J in the other tree. And you're going to get that uh, 
Bij is going to be just a random matrix, which is n prime by n prime. And each entry is one with probability 1 minus q, independently of the other entries. You just take b uniformly at ran well, not uniformly, but you take it at random, where every entry has probability 1 minus q, independently of the other entries. But so far, uh, you didn't use the fact that you named the rows and columns. <coughs> right. So that's where we're, that's completely right. And that's how we're going to make m from that fact. We're going to use that. So we're going to now make an n by n matrix m. Um, and uh, this uh, n by n matrix, so b was n prime by n prime, the n by n matrix, the n by n matrix m, it's going to have uh, m i j 1. So i will end up being uh, a leaf of tr, and j is going to be a leaf of tc. And you're going to make m i j 1 if all of the ancestors of i, and there's r plus 1 of them, and these are precisely the intervals that contain i, if all of them uh, make a 1 with all of the ancestors of j, there's r plus 1 of those in b. And you can think of b as a complete bipartite graph. So you can look at the adjacency matrix. And you can think of the rows as being uh, vertices uh, of one part, the columns being vertices of the other part. And uh, you, get this you get this bipartite graph between the vertices in TR and the vertices of TC, where every edge appears with probability 1 minus Q. So that's one way of thinking about B. And then I and J will make MIJ equal to 1 if i and its ancestors, so there's r plus 1 vertices, and j and its ancestors make a complete bipartite graph with parts of size r plus 1 and r plus 1. Is that clear? So this is the definition of m. And then I'm going to show you that with positive probability, we can pick, well, m will be, b will be picked in such a way that m will satisfy the properties of the, th of the, the theorem. Is there any questions about this so far, about the construction? So TR, they're just two identical trees. One corresponds to the rows, and one corresponds to the columns um, that we're going to make to make M. And uh, we have this intermediate uh, matrix B, which will be used uh, to make M. Right. Which are naturally partitioned to dyadic intervals. And you connect I and J within all the pairs of dyadic intervals containing them. You are lucky enough to get a one in some of them. Exactly. And so that's the L squared, uh, not L squared. R plus one. Okay, so uh, so as Avi pointed out, there's different ways of explaining of explaining this, um, uh, and it's it's not so difficult, but there's a couple steps in the process of, of defining it. Okay, um, now we want to show that there's a choice of B that is JL free, so it avoids JL, uh, and M has mass at least n to the three halves. So once you've constructed so there's a choice of B which makes M have mass at least n to the three halves, and it and it avoids J L. Not yes, and uh, and the first part, um, well, you can check pretty easily. The thing is, here we're going to have B avoid J L in terms of usual containment, and we're going to show then that this is going to imply that M will avoid J L as an interval minor. So first, let's show that we can find such a B with these properties. Can everyone see this board OK? Half of it. Maybe I should move over here then. OK. So uh, 
Okay. So we'll pick a, a random variable, which is just the mass of M. Because B is a random matrix and M was defined from B, this X will be a random variable. Mass of M, the number of ones. Now, each entry of M will, a, will be a one with probability one minus Q to the R plus one squared. Because each, uh, each entry of M uh, will appear if you have a complete bipartite graph in the bipartite graph corresponding to B. So uh, by linearity of expectation, the expected value of X is just one minus Q to the R plus one squared times N squared. Um, now let's look at the probability that X is at least one minus Q times its expected value. We'll just apply Markov's inequality here and we get, um, so we wanna, we wanna show that X has some reasonable probability of being uh, fairly large. So let's look at the probability that it, X is at least one minus Q times its expected value. And one thing to note is that X is always at most n squared. So the expected value of X is at most um, the probability that X is at least one minus Q uh, times its expected value times n squared. So if it's at least one minus Q times the expected value, you know it's still at most n squared, and so you don't have any problem in that case. Otherwise, the X is at most one minus Q times the expected value. So then you get one minus Q times the expected value of X. So you're adding one minus Q times the expected value of X. So we have this simple inequality here. Um, and, uh, well, we can try to solve for the probability that X is at least one minus Q times the expected value. And we subtract this from both sides and you get Q times the expected value of, of X divided by N squared is a lower bound on the probability that X is at least one minus Q times its expected value. And we know the expected value of X. And so we get that the probability that X is at least one minus Q times its expected value is at least, well the N squares will cancel and you'll get an extra Q factor, Q times one minus Q to the R plus one squared. So you have some reasonable probability that X is at least roughly its expected value. Okay, so this is a very simple, uh, Argument. Now, you don't need. Um, so this is a reasonable bound for uh, if you want to to get the mass to be really close to n squared. So if you change the parameters yeah, and you want that, then you can replace a half, and then this will become a half. Yeah. Uh, in front. Okay, but, but this is still a reasonable probability. And let's look at the probability that uh, B contains JL. Well, uh, for each L by L submatrix of B, you have uh, a one minus Q to the L squared probability that uh, uh, that it makes a copy of JL. And there's N prime, choose L squared choices for the L by L submatrix. So this is the amount of, J, uh, of copies of JL you expect. And so the probability that it contains one is at most this. And you can easily check with a choice of parameters, uh, whoops. Sorry. Uh, you can easily check with the choice of parameters that the probability that it contains a, a JL is smaller than the chance that 
x is at least 1 minus q times its expected value. And the 1 minus q times the expected value you can also check is at least uh, n to the 3 halves. So these are very simple computations. No one wants to, to see something trivial, so uh, we won't do this here. Maybe you can insert the addition to the one to the computation. Are you doing this case? You may, may minus some product of the number of variables. Mm -hmm. So you can just pick it at once. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. That will work. So you can combine both of them into one random variable, and, uh, and that random variable will allow you to delete a 1 for each copy of JL you get. There's so few you expect that uh, <coughs> it will still be in good shape. Ah, yes. So as, as, as Noga pointed out, so yeah, so deleting a 1 from B can become problematic um, because, yes, so as, as Noga pointed out, um, just so we understand M a little bit better, uh, if there was not an edge uh, between the top vertex in, in TR and the top vertex of TC, that in B, if you think of B as this bipartite graph, uh, then M will just be empty. And so you really need to have that edge there uh, in particular. So uh, you have to be careful with weighing things based on their size if you do an argument along the way that Noga was suggesting. Okay, great. So, uh, and then to finish the proof, so we, got we have this B. Um, suppose for contradiction that M contained a JL interval minor. What that means is, so here's our M. There's going to be intervals of rows and intervals of columns. So these are intervals that you'll see. Uh, so that in the sub, in the block that comes from some I A and I and, and L B that block you get will have to have at least one one for each A and B, where A and B run from one to L. Uh, so suppose this thing existed, these, these intervals of, of rows and intervals of columns. Uh, now for each, for each interval of rows, so I sub A, we're going to give it a vertex from the tree TR. So each interval of rows will give it a vertex from the tree, which is precisely the interval in this tree, so uh, which is of largest height and contains this interval I sub A. So each of these intervals of rows, they're going to be contained in the root. And if it's uh, contained in one of the, the two uh, children, you go down and you keep going down until you get to <coughs> some vertex where I sub A is still contained in there, but it's not contained in either of the children. And that will be your V sub A. Similar, similarly, for each interval of columns, you'll associate some vertex in the tree TC. And the, the key claim here is that V1 to VL are distinct and W1 to WL are distinct. So why are these distinct? Well, suppose otherwise, so you had some VA, equals VA prime. So you have this interval, VA and VA prime, and that means that uh, I sub A will be an interval in here that's contained in this VA, and I sub A prime will also be an interval contained in, in VA. These are disjoint intervals, and if you have two intervals inside this interval, which is partitioned into two children intervals, then one of them has to be contained in, the children, in one of the children because they can't both intersect the middle. Only one of them can because they're disjoint intervals. So VA has to be different from VA prime, therefore all the V1 to VL are distinct and all the, the U1 to UL are distinct. 
And therefore, you have uh, a JL sum matrix of B, uh, which is complete. So the reason for that is um, VA has to be adjacent to UB, meaning uh, the VA UB in, in B has to be a 1, because if it's a 0, then the corresponding sum matrix of M, you'll have an interval of rows and an interval of columns, which is all zeros. And I sub A is contained in V sub A, and L of B is contained in U sub B. So for there to be a 1 in the block corresponding to IA times ILB, it would have to be inside the block from VA versus UB, and because it's all zeros, that's impossible. So these two, VA and UB, always have to be, uh, have to be adjacent, and therefore you get this complete uh, J JL, contradicting that B is JL free. Is there any questions about this? Okay. So this, this uh, binary tree enables you to convert and lock in this place at least one one, but you don't know where in the one uh, position the, the one is. Yes. Yeah. Isolate. Right. Mm-hmm. That's correct. Okay. So now we'll go from here to these lower bounds on Stanley Wolf and Variety Heinel limits. So uh, let k be L squared. And there's going to be a k permutation pi we saw earlier whose matrix contains JL as an interval monitor. And since this M that we constructed avoids JL as an interval minor, it's also going to avoid pi because this pi that we picked will, will has to contain JL as an interval minor. Uh, hence, the extremal number of n versus pi. Now, n is this particular number, which is exponential in L to the 1 half, which therefore is exponential in k to the 1 quarter. This uh, extremal number is at least n to the 3 halves. And since this extremal number is super additive, it follows that the Ferretti Heinel limit is at least um, n to the 1 half. And n here is exponential in k to the 1 fourth. So the Ferretti Heinel limit's at least exponential in k to the 1 fourth. And because these are polynomially related, the Stanley Wolf limit and the Ferretti Heinel limit, uh, you end up getting that L of pi is also exponential in k to the 1 quarter. Uh, you can also do this by hand to show once you have a lot of ones that, uh, in fact, you can get many permutations uh, which avoid pi. So you can, there's a, a rather quick way to do this by hand, but we'll just use this result here. Okay, is there any questions about this? Okay. So now let's turn to the upper bounds, which are, are really uh, uh, short and sweet uh, proofs. Um, so we look at Sn pi, which is the number <laughs> of permutations which avoid pi of length n. Now let's look at Tn pi, which is the number of n by n matrices which avoid pi. So they don't have to be permutation matrices that avoid pi. It's all matrices, and you're counting them, uh, n by n, which avoid pi. Um, uh, Clauser proved that Tn pi is exponential in the extremal number of n and pi. And the lower bound's really easy. Once you have one matrix that has this extremal number of ones, you can look at all the, the sum matrices where you, the ones you can be either zero or one, and you get two choices for each of the one entries. And so you get two to the extremal number of n pi possible uh, sum matrices in terms of containment, uh, spanning containment. Uh, now for the upper bound, it follows from, uh, by induction from the following inequality that t 2 n pi is at most t n pi times 15 to the extremal number of n and pi. Uh, and why is this? Um, So let's look at a 2n by 2n matrix which avoids pi. We'll call it A. So it's 2n by 2n, and it avoids pi. Now, uh, so it's 2n by 2n. You can partition the columns into n, uh, into n intervals of length 2, and you can partition the rows into 
n intervals of length 2. And so you get these 2 by 2 blocks, and it, you get an n by n matrix if you contract the intervals of rows and columns. So contract by, con uh, so you get B, which is n by n by contraction, where whenever there's at least one 1 in the 2 by 2, you get a, a 1 entry in B. It is B also avoids pi. Um, because uh, avoiding a permutation is equivalent to avoiding it as an interval minor. Okay, so we get this n by n matrix. How many choices do we have for B? There's Tn of pi potential choices. And for each copy of B, there's going to be at most 15 to the extremal number of n pi choices for A that go to this B. The reason for this is for every one entry in B, you get 15 potential ways of filling in that 2 by 2 in A that corresponds to that one entry in B because there's 15 2 by 2 matrices that contain at least one 1. And so you have 15 choices for each of the one entries in B, and therefore uh, you get this inequality. Is that clear? For, for the, so we're trying to count the number of possible A's, um, and we get this inequality. Right. So, so the way that Clauser and, and Marcus and Tardos get a bound on Sn pi is they bound it by Tn pi. It contains all the permutation matrices. So this is the, the rather trivial estimate. And then we'll see how to improve on this. That's a good question. So that's how uh, you would get a, an upper bound on Sn pi. Um, now, to get a better bound, the Stanley Wolf limit's at most quadratic in the Ferretti Heinel limit. So we'll see a, a proof that looks very similar to what we just saw, but we get a much better bound. And this is this, this new simple proof that we have. Um, and, uh, so instead of 2n by 2n, let's look at tn by tn. And instead of looking at all uh, matrices which avoid pi, we're only going to look at permutation matrices because we really want to bound on Sn pi and not Tn pi. So let's look at a permutation matrix, A, which avoids pi, and it's Tn by Tn. And we're going to let T times little n be big N. We're going to get this inequality of S of big N of pi is at most T of little n of pi times little t to the 2n, <coughs> 2 times big N. There's a lot of t's and n's here, sorry, <laughs> for this. That are big N by big N that avoid pi. And you're going to bound it by the number of total matrices which avoid pi, which are little n by little n times this little t to the two, n, two times big N. Why is that? We set up exactly in the same way as we did before, except instead of two by twos, we're going to have t by t's. We take this permutation matrix A and we contract it to get a matrix B which avoids pi. Uh, this is a little n by little n, and so there's at most tn of pi choices for our b. Now let's see how many possible choices there are for a given the b. Well, b was this contraction of a tn by, of a TN by tn matrix a, and you contracted consecutive intervals of length t, these intervals of length t. Now let's look at the first, let's look at each row of b. Each row of B has at most T1s because each row of A has, a, has one one, and there's T of these rows which contract to make, uh, to make one row of B. So each row of B will have at most little T1s, and uh, it follows that each row of A will have at most T squared possible choices for the one in that row once you've already fixed B, because there's T1s in B, and each of these blocks are T by T, so you get T squared possible choices for each one in, uh, in, in, in each row for A, given B, al already given B. So each row, there's going to be T squared possible choices for the one, and you have big N rows in, in A, so you get T, to the, T squared to the N, possible choices for A given their B. And hence, we get this inequality. 
Now we just need to choose the right value of t, which we pick to be c of pi. Of course, c of pi might not be an integer here. You can always round to the nearest integer, and, and it's not really a, an issue. Uh, so picking t to be c of pi, you get this inequality, and uh, taking both sides to the 1 over n and letting n tend to infinity, you get some constant times c of pi squared uh, is an upper bound for L of pi. Okay, so uh, this is how we get uh, this. Pi, I mean, this um, right, so you, 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 uh, you take both sides to the 1 over big N, yeah, right. and then you get this constant times C of pi squared. And the, on the left side is uh, when you take the limit, you'll get L, L of pi. Um, I, I think you'll, if you, this is the right choice up to this constant factor, up to the constant factor you get in front. So uh, you can probably optimize, yeah. Um, right. So in the remaining three minutes, I want to show you the Marcus Tardosh proof, because it's really nice. Um, and again, we saw several proofs using this figure, and the Marcus Tardos proof will also use this figure. So again, it's by this interval minor contraction. And for a lot of these bounds, often you, you just use the fact that pi is contained in JL. So you're going to find JL as an interval minor, and that's going to be enough to get whatever permutation you want. And this is how these, a lot of these proofs work, um, and, and don't actually work through the, the given permutation pi. So we're going to prove this upper bound on the extremal number. This follows by induction from uh, this inequality. So induction on n from this inequality, you get this, this bound. Uh, and then we'll show where this inequality comes from. So uh, we start off with a little n by little n matrix, and uh, a, which avoids pi. And uh, we're going to split into um, intervals of length k squared, both the, the columns and the rows. And you have these k squared by k squared blocks all over the place. Uh, now you're going to define one of these k squared by k squared blocks to be, so this is k squared by k squared. You define it to be wide if at least k columns of it, of the k squared, have a 1 in that column, at least one 1. So that's what a wide block is. And a tall is defined similarly, at least k 1s in, in its rows. And there's at least k rows that have a 1 in it. So that's wide and tall. Um, and now do this contraction. So, uh, so you contract all these intervals, and you get an n over k squared by n over k squared matrix B. Which avoids, uh, which avoids pi as well. Um, now, each column of B can, can contain at most, it will have less than k times k squared choose k ones from wide blocks. Why is this? Well, if you had k times k squared choose k wide blocks, uh, in a given column, you'll have uh, each of the col each of the wide blocks will have k columns that have a one in it, and so because of the pigeonhole principle, because you have so many wide wide blocks in a given column, you'll have k of them which will have uh, ones in the same k columns, and when you contract that, you'll get a, a, a jk interval minor. When you contract these uh, blocks the rows, uh, the intervals of rows, you'll end up getting k, uh, you'll get a jk interval minor, and hence uh, you'll get pi as a submatrix, the, the, the permutation matrix of pi. Is that clear? So this k test, the k plus this k just identify which of which k of the k plus columns you are looking at? Exactly, and then because of the k, you want a k of them. So, uh, 
Yes. OK, so uh, how many one entries in A can come from uh, uh, wide blocks? Um, so in wide blocks, there's at most, in any given column of B, there's going to be at most uh, k times k squared choose k uh, ones in B. Each block in B will have at most k to the fourth ones because any block has at most k to the fourth ones, because it's k squared by k squared. Uh, the number of columns of b is at most, well, it's equal to n over k squared. So the product of these th last three factors is an upper bound of the number of ones you have in wide blocks. Uh, so ones in a that come from wide blocks. And similarly, uh, by symmetry, you get at most the same number of ones in a that come from tall blocks. So you get another fact, you get a factor two in front. If you take this product out, that's the second term in, in this inequality, uh, that you're adding these two things. Uh, so uh, now the remaining uh, blocks are neither wide nor tall that we haven't contributed for. If a block is neither wide or tall, it has ones in at most k minus 1 columns and 1's in at most k minus 1 rows, and therefore it contains at most k minus 1 squared 1's. Uh, and the number of those blocks that contain at least one 1 in them is at most the extremal number of n over k squared times, uh, n over k squared pi, this extremal number, because uh, this b that we get also avoids pi. And so we get the total number of 1's we bound by the right-hand side in A. And A we pick to be an N by N which avoids pi. Okay. So the key thing is that the right-hand side is linear and the second one, the K minus one squared, is smaller than K squared. Exactly. So you get a geometric uh, a sum and you get an extra factor K which gives you this uh, because of the how quickly this converges, the geometric sum. Okay, so uh, using this notion of interval minors, you don't have to make things k squared by k, uh, by k squared, these blocks. You can make them much bigger and def change your definition of wide and tall. And uh, what you will have is that it'll be wide or tall if it contains at least uh, s columns with, w with ones in them, or s rows, and uh, you'll make it s squared by s squared. And you can try to do th some similar uh, arguments and with interval minors you can then use this idea to get uh, an exponential bound on k in front of n instead of uh, exponential on k log k. k, 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 k no, you, ha you have to be, you have to do more work. Uh, so the, this is the optimal parameters for this proof, yeah. Almost. Uh, it's close to optimal. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You have to do some, something else, but it's not far removed. It's heavily inspired by this, but adding this idea that you just need to see things as interval minors instead of really trying to create a sort of a JK after doing a small amount of contractions. You can do more and, uh, and, 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 and avoid it. Um, so, uh, so the bound that this proof gives, and one's not. We're not really optimizing things, but k times 2 to the 5k will come out of the proof without. Mm. This is for, uh, for a jk interval minor, yes. So, and, and the, for jk interval minor as a lower bound, we saw uh, 2 to the root k times n. So there's still a, a good size gap. I don't believe the upper bound. I think it should be sub-exponential in k. It may be even closer to the lower bound that we saw earlier for jk. And then we get this extra quadratic loss because we were going between, uh, for permutations, because uh, we knew, we were using the fact that every, uh, that jk is contained in some permutation of size k squared as an interval minor. For the permutation. That's right. Um, the, the thing is, in the, it's, it's quite difficult to try to make a permutation without making a JK interval minor. And so uh, 
it seems very plausible that the bounds are different, but this is the way that the proofs have been going so far uh, in this area. Um, just a couple final comments about, uh, about this. Is, so one natural question that, that Noga uh, brought up is, is what are the right bounds here? And we know this exponential in some power of k, and it would be interesting, I think, to close the gaps here. Um, another question you can ask is a Ramsey-type variant of this. So we were looking at a Turan type or density type theorem where you see how many ones can you put in in order to get jk as an interval minor. The Ramsey type question would be you take a, a big jn, you color every one of the entries, these are all ones, you color them red and blue, and uh, how big of a monochromatic uh, jk interval minor can you, can you force? And already for n being quadratic in k, there's a very simple argument that shows that you'll have to have uh, jk as an interval minor monochromatically uh, if you color the ones red and blue. And this is very different from the Turan type question we've already saw because in the Turan type question, if you pick the parameters differently, you can get density very close to one and get exponential size in k and still avoid jk as an interval minor. So uh, this is a problem where the Turan type and the Ramsey type problem are, are have very different behavior, which is uh, which is pretty interesting, I think. Um, uh, finally, coming back to this conjecture of, about conjecture about layered permutations, that these were sort of the hardest permutations to avoid, uh, it's, it seems that actually it's the opposite is true. That the reason why a, a permutation has large Stanley Wolf limit is because it contains a large uh, JK uh, uh, interval minor. And uh, the layered permutations you can classify as forbidding two different uh, three uh, permutations on three letters. So there's two permutations on three letters which are avoided by layered permutations. This is a characterization of layered permutations. So this is saying that layered permutations are, uh, avoid some very small stuff. And uh, it seems that to make a large Stanley Wilf limit, you need to have a large uh, JK interval minor. And there's some uh, evidence for this, but uh, one conjecture is that if you avoid some fixed uh, JL as an interval minor, so you have this permutation pi, it's a K permutation, then maybe the Stanley Wolf limit should be only polynomial in K. Um, so that's a conjecture that I have. And uh, um, so it seems to suggest that the, the really the opposite is true for these, uh, uh, for why uh, Stanley Wolf limits and Faraday Heino limits should be large. Okay, I've uh, gone over time. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, it's just size three, yeah. No, I, I have no uh, real evidence for this. We know that uh, it will be large if it contains a large JL minor, where uh, for your K permutation, L should be at least logarithmic. Some poly, uh, poly logarithmic in K will be enough to guarantee that uh, the Stanley Wolf limit will be super polynomial, just applying. This follows from this, yeah. So, but I think maybe the con this something like a converse is true. Yes, there's no there's no uh, no proofs for this. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's I, I'm I'm not saying that it's it's widely believed or I, I strongly believe this, but it seems plausible, and I'll pose it as a I, I'm posing it as a conjecture, but um, I don't really have good evidence for it. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, there there might be some other nice way of, of doing this. Um, I've been uh, going back and forth between a few different ways of of describing this uh, matrix M, and uh, uh, yeah, so it's a very good question. There, uh, in terms of maybe there's a nice probabilistic model already out there that's kind of you just plug in and see that everything works nicely. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks. <laughs>